Just a reminder, uh, just to put us in the picture, to put us in the map in a sense. What I'm doing with Romans is dividing it almost certainly into at least three different uh, seasons or series. The one we did last year, which was the winter of uh, 2013 and 2014. And in that one, we did these sections, which was series one. So now we're coming on to... Um, series two, which is this uh, thing called From Death to Life. Um, and the, the pattern is that what I want to do is to make it available so that people can see it on the internet, but also so that they can ask questions and we can maybe answer some of the questions and maybe ask some questions that other folks haven't answered anyway. So we're looking at series two. And this is how we're going to divide it up tonight. We're going to link up with the context to try and keep it all in context. Do you remember I said that one of the difficulties with something like Romans is finding the right balance. You can either go too fine, <coughs> excuse me, um, and go into too much detail, and then you lose the big picture, or you can concentrate on the big picture, and then you lose all the fascinating, intricate details. And I'm trying to do both at the same time. So this is what we're going to do tonight. We're going to try and link up with the context. And then we're going to ask some questions. We're going to say, well, um, who are these people that we're reading about here in Romans chapter 5? And then I want to talk about subjective and objective truth. <clears throat> there are some people who get a bit panicky when you talk about subjective and objective. So we'll... I'll explain what I mean by that in my unique setting uh, in a little while. Then we're going to ask a question, what has happened to these people? The people that Paul is referring to, just what exactly has happened to them? This really is very important. Maybe you remember that when we started this, we were saying that um, it's important to find out who wrote a letter, but it's also important to identify the people to whom the letter was written. Because if we may presume certain things, thank you, Jane. <laughs> we may presume certain things um, that we're presuming in error. We may presume that these people have exactly the same experience as we have, um, and then we shall come to wrong conclusions. So I want to be absolutely sure we know who we're talking about and just what these people had experienced in their own life. And then, this is the main thing I really want to get to, I want to begin what I think is the heart of Romans, which is the story of two men. We're going to look at two men and see how these two men have had uh, an amazing and continuing impact upon the human race. Um, I won't say more about that at this stage, we'll say when we get to it. Okay, so just to remind you of where we are in the letter to the Romans, um, we started off with the first couple of chapters with Paul showing that the whole world was guilty before God, that they were without excuse. It didn't matter who they were, it didn't matter what their background was, whether they were idolaters, uh, whether they were philosophers or rational men who may have said, well, uh, we, we, we can't be blamed because we didn't know. And Paul says, well, he is the evidence that you did know and that actually you've turned away from revelation. And then he speaks to the Jewish people and he says, well, you are the people that God trusted the oracles of God to. Um, and in, in spite of that, in fact, not only are you not the people who are attracting praise to God, that's what Judah really means, praise, but in fact, because of you, God's name is blasphemed among the heathen. So he says that the whole world is guilty before God. But he says that the just, the just one, that's Christ himself, 
has suffered for the unjust. That's really a quotation from Peter in Peter's letter when he says that Christ suffered for our sins, the just for the unjust to bring us to God. So that's Christ's substitutionary atonement. He is taking our place. He suffered in himself the anger of God against sin for the whole human race. And that because of that, people who put their faith in him, God declares the ungodly to be right with him. God doesn't wait until the ungodly become godly. He doesn't wait until we become righteous before he declares us to be right with him. He declares us to be right with him um, on the basis of our faith in Jesus Christ. When the ungodly put their whole trust in Christ, God reckons it to them for righteousness. And if you remember, we use that little um, pigeon English phrase from Papua New Guinea, which was God, him say, me okay. God declares me to be right with him, not because I have achieved righteousness, but because I've put my trust in the one, the one righteous person who has actually suffered the penalty for all unrighteousness. Okay, and then we said, this is where we were last time, that there is more, that although justification by faith um, is such a basic fundamental doctrine, that isn't where the gospel ends, that's the foundation. In fact, there's more, there's much more, and we began just at the end of the last session to begin to look at that. And I mentioned that we have, one of the versions says, an introduction into this grace. It's a, that's a perfectly legitimate translation. Most of our translations say that we have access um, by faith into this grace wherein we stand. But the word that's translated access could just as honestly be translated introduction. And it's a fascinating picture. If you can imagine the picture of um, maybe there's someone who lives in a big house which is inaccessible to you. Maybe it's a king or a queen or something like that. And you have no right of access at all. But there's someone who gives you an introduction. Someone who actually takes you into the presence of the king. And Paul really is using that kind of language when he says that to buy grace into faith, we have access by grace into faith, into this faith in which we stand. So we are introduced into the much more of the gospel, not just justification by faith. Justification is by faith it is wonderful. And I'm always, I always feel a little bit guilty when I say just justification by faith because it's, it is fabulous. It's wonderful what God has done. But it's not the end of the story. There is more. There is much more. And that's the bit that we're coming on to now. We have an, in, an introduction into this grace wherein we stand. And then Paul said, using strange language, he said, this hope that we have doesn't need to be ashamed. It's, it's not a hope which needs to be embarrassed or blushed. And he has a reason for that. The reason he's absolutely sure that what he is saying is true is really quite fascinating. This is what he has to say. He says, Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given unto us. Now that is, um, that, I think that's from the New American Standard Bible. Uh, Romans 5 and verse 5. The hope that we have doesn't need to feel embarrassed. We need, don't need to be embarrassed about the hope that we have. And the reason for that is because something has happened, something tangible, something that Paul can say, we know, not just we think, not just we've got our theology nice and tidy now, but something has happened to the people that Paul is writing to, and something has happened to Paul, which is why he's using words like this. We'll see it in a moment. So who are the people that Paul is writing to when he writes to the saints, he calls them, in Rome? And he uses words uh, like this. He uses this word, our and us. So who is he thinking about? If I say our and us, in this kind of context, I mean you and me. And we have something in common. We're all in this meeting together. So when Paul uses words like our and us, he's referring to people with whom he knows he has something in common. Are you following that? 
Okay? Now, the question is, what is it that Paul has in common with these people that he's writing to, these people that he calls the saints at Rome? And the thing that he has in common with them is that they have had an encounter with God in the power of the Holy Spirit, which has been absolutely crystal clear. They have absolutely no doubt about this, which is why Paul uses this kind of language. And he says, um, he's talking about the love of God, and he says, it has been poured out, the love of God. This isn't a theory. This is a testimony, this verse. The love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. That's, um, that's an event. There has been an event in the lives of these people. There's been an event in the life of Paul, which enables Paul to gather himself and his readers together and speak in terms of our and us and we. They have this common element that they are people who have received the Holy Spirit. Now that is a really big statement and we all need to look at it and see just what the implications of that are. They have had an experience of God. This is really important to understand that Paul's letters don't come from a university lecturer's study. They're not academic things. They are they're really as much testimony as they are theology. They, they come from Paul's experience, and he knows he's speaking into people who have had the same experience. They know what he's talking about, because they themselves have experienced the same as he has experienced. They've had an experience of God, and you'll see there, at a point in time, the Holy Spirit was given. I don't want to... Um, I don't want to kind of unsettle anybody, but they, they didn't believe this on the basis of a verse that they'd read in the Bible. It, it, it wasn't a verse that convinced them that they had received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came with such clarity that they knew that they had received the Holy Spirit. This is an event. It's not, um, it's not a notion. It's not a revelation of something that's always been true. This is an event. This is a, a was event. The Holy Spirit was given to us. And the Holy Spirit was given to them. As a result of that, the love of God has been and remains. The, the Greek language is really fascinating in the way it uses verbs. And there's amazing um, precision in the way that they use the verbs. So when it speaks about the love of God being poured out in the heart, it actually uses the perfect tense in Bible Greek, which actually means something like the love of God has been poured out and is still poured out. So it's something that starts in the past, but its effect is continuing right into the present. The love of God is still present in their hearts. There was a time when the love of God was poured out within their hearts, but that experience has continued. And then the next little thing he says, uh, this is why Paul is confident, uh, because this has happened, and this is my question, is this theology or testimony? Well, it's, it's really, mostly it's testimony, but it can become theology for us as we try to understand what is, we're being told here. Well, I think we need to talk about receiving the Holy Spirit and just exactly... What do we mean by this when we come to the Bible? Because many different Christians from many different backgrounds have different views as to what it really means to receive the Spirit. So what I want to do is to, uh, not in great detail, but I just want to point to one or two places which give us, I think, a clear indication of what Paul is talking about when he uses this phrase about receiving the Spirit. Okay? So we've got to dig down a little bit. What does it mean to receive the Spirit? Well, this is my sort of definition. This is what I mean by it. I mean full initiation into all the saving life of Christ. I mean someone having been absolutely immersed into the life of God. Not just 
a passing touch, not just mercy drops here and there. Let me tell you, you, you perhaps know this anyway, but there are two words um, in, used in the Bible that sound very similar, but they're slightly different. One is babto, and babto means to dip something. And the other one is baptizo, and that one means to immerse something. And there is an old recipe from the Jamie Oliver equivalent of kind of the first century BC or something like that. And he tells how you pickle onions. And this is, this is his recipe. It goes something like this. He says, first of all, you take the onions, you peel the onions, and then you babto them. There's the first word. You babto them in boiling water. I think that's what your ladies call blanching, isn't it? Okay? So you, that, that's, that's a, you, you just kind of dip it in. That's it. And then it says, when you've done that, you make an infusion of spices with all the different herbs and peppers and different things. My mouth is watering. I love pickled onions. <laughs> um, and then you baptizo the onions that you have babtoed into the marinade of all these juices. And you leave it there until it soaks up all the flavors, all the tastes that are in this thing. So that when you take it out, it is impossible to separate the flavors from the onion. The two have become absolutely one. Okay? So these are the two words. Babto, this isn't the word where you, I'm talking about now. Babto really means just to dip something. But baptizo has this idea of holding something under the water. So it's, it's a word that they used when they were dyeing cloth. You know, there's this kind of wonderful question you can ask children at Sunday school. There's a woman in the Bible who died for a living. Do you know her name? Yes. <laughs> Lydia died for a living. Yes, that was her. That's what she did. And she would have taken something like a white cloth and she would have immersed it into the famous purple dyes um, that she was kind of famous for um, and would have kept it there until the purple had soaked into the warp and weave of the fabric. And when you pulled it out, no one would be able to separate the purple from the cloth. The two would have become absolutely one. That's the concept of baptism. Baptizo. Joining something so that it becomes one with the thing that you join it to. Okay, so I'm talking about full initiation into the saving life of Christ. And I'm pressing a button here, valiantly. And there we go. This is what Jesus said shortly before the cross. He said, he spoke about the coming spirit and he said, he referred to him as the spirit of truth. And he said, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells within you and will be in you. I'm still pressing my button. There we go. These two words, with and in, are real demarcation words. Under the Old Covenant, men and women knew the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon them. They knew the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon their faculties, coming upon their brains, upon their bodies. So there was a sense in which the Holy Spirit came upon them as people. But Jesus is referring to here not just to an endowment of power on someone's body or on someone's mind. Maybe you remember that um, it says, it refers to um, a man named Bezalel and Aholiab, who were the, um, the architects really for the, the tabernacle or the people who were in charge of all the artifacts. Um, and it says that they were filled with the Spirit of God. But it was their minds that were filled. They, they, they were given abilities. But Jesus is referring here to something that isn't just adding on abilities. He's talking about someone 
coming and taking up residence within the person so that the person becomes their home. And he says this to his disciples. He says, you know him, for he dwells with you. And he did dwell with them. He had, he had empowered them to heal the sick and raise the dead, to cast out demons, to preach the gospel. Um, all these things, they had known the power of the Holy Spirit. But something new was going to happen. Uh, he, uh, so far, all you've known is that he is with you. We, we're moving on to something different, and he will come and be on the inside of you. We're talking about the indwelling spirit, which actually is a very much a new covenant truth rather than an old covenant truth. Okay. Now then, what do I mean by this? When we're trying to find out what the Bible means by this full initiation into Christ, when we're trying to find out what the Bible means by, um, by receiving the Spirit, we have a problem. Um, and the problem is, was very well expressed by David Pawson many years ago in a book that he wrote called um, The Normal Christian Birth, I think it was called. And he was talking about being initiated fully into Christ. And he made this point and he said, the problem is when we try to understand what the Bible means by receiving the Spirit, or if we try to understand what the Bible means by being baptized in the Spirit, we've got a problem. We've got two problems. In fact, the first problem is this, that the Gospels are too early because he hasn't come yet. So we're not going to get eyewitness accounts of what it means to receive the Spirit, to be baptized in the Spirit in the Gospels. Because he doesn't come in the Gospels. He comes in the Acts of the Apostles. Are you with me so far? So if we're trying to understand what, it, the, what the Bible means by receiving the Spirit, in a sense, the Gospels are too early. And then he makes this point. He says, the epistles and the revelation are too late. And what he means by that is this. It's a really good point. What he's, he's saying is what I've been trying to say so far. That when Paul writes his letters... He's writing with the assumption that he's writing to people who have had the same kind of experience as he has had. Because it is the norm in the first century. The normal Christian experience in the first century is that people receive the Holy Spirit without any shadow of any doubt. They know it's happened. So those are the kind of people that he's writing to. And you can see it kind of this assumption leaks out in, in two places in particular. Um, to understand this event, this moment of receiving the Spirit, we need the Acts of the Apostles. And some people get very hesitant about the Acts. They say, well, we shouldn't use the Acts of the Apostles for doctrine because it's just a story. It's just a kind of a history. But the Bible says that all Scripture is given for teaching, and that includes the Acts of the Apostles. So we do need to look at the Acts of the Apostles to see exactly uh, what we're talking about here. It was a conscious event. It wasn't just believing a verse. It wasn't making a logical conclusion, adding this verse to this verse, and then saying, well, therefore I must be someone who has received the Spirit. It, it isn't that. It's the, this, this was an event. Let's um, go on. So the people he is talking to are people who um, have experienced an event. And I'm going to talk a little bit now about objective or subjective truth. This is really the question about whether we're talking about revelation truth or personal experience. There are some truths in the Bible which you read and maybe you read them often. Um, but there will come a time when your heart opens to them and you suddenly see them at another level. That's what I mean by revelation truth. It's when the Holy Spirit reveals truth to you. And you see something, it didn't just happen the moment you saw it, it actually was there all along. But now is the right time for God to reveal it to you. Do you remember the Lord said to his disciples on one occasion, I have many things to share, say to you, but you're not able to bear it yet. And because we need to grow in our faith, God opens truth to us slowly. It doesn't all come at once. We need to learn and, and go on kind of learning. So, for example, 
Um, suppose you were reading um, in Ephesians and you came across this truth that comes out very clearly in Ephesians that Paul says we are united with Christ and we are seated with him in the heavenlies or in the heavenly places. Now, being in the heavenly places is not a subjective experience. It, it's not another event that takes place in your life. And you suddenly say, I've just sat down in the heavenly places. It doesn't work like that. What it is, it's something that God opens your mind to, opens your understanding to. So it's objective truth. And when you've seen the objective truth, then you're required to live in the light of it. But it isn't something tangible. Let me, I can see one or two people just looking a bit puzzled, which is always a good sign because it means they're thinking. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's like this. Let me take the word taste. The word taste in the Bible doesn't really mean to sample something. You know, taste and see that the Lord is good doesn't mean, you know, just have a try. It doesn't mean that. It speaks, if you remember, in Hebrews of Jesus tasting death for every man. He was not sampling death. He experienced death to its last dregs, to its last drop. It means to fully experience something. So when the Bible talks about tasting things, it means experiencing them consciously. Now, receiving the Spirit is a tasting experience. It's, it's an experience in which someone receives consciously the incoming life of God himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. But there are other truths, and these truths are very important truths. There are truths, for, us, for example, that we have been translated from the power of darkness into life. And maybe a time comes when you're reading that and you suddenly realize that all those powers that have been harassing you and changing, you, chasing you actually have no power of your life at all. Because you've been translated from that kingdom. And you've been brought into another kingdom. The kingdom of the Son of God's love. And it will transform your expectations. It will transform the way in which you resist temptation. It, very often we're fighting the wrong battles. Because we've not understood things that God wants us to understand. So there is a difference between a tasted truth and an understood truth. And understood truths are important but receiving the Spirit is a tasted truth. Okay? Okay. When Paul went to the little group, I don't know that there were hardly a church at this time at Ephesus, um, in Acts chapter 19, the Bible says that when he got there, he was met with this group of people, and it looks as though there were about 12 of them, or at least 12 men anyway. And he asks them a question. And the question he asks them is this. This is me putting it in, into modern English, but the, the tenses would support exactly what I'm saying now. He asks them this question. He says, when you believed, did you receive the Holy Spirit? There's obviously something that Paul is uncomfortable with here, with this group. Um, he knows that they've been under the ministry of Apollos. Um, he knows that they have, um, that they are, regarded as disciples but there's something about them which doesn't quite ring true and he is not judging them to condemn them he is diagnosing their condition in order to help them that's what he's doing we need we need to make a distinction sometimes we need to diagnose people's condition so that we can help them and paul says to these people when you believed i can imagine him with a kind of a slightly puzzled look on his face uh, when you believed, did you receive the Holy Spirit? He's not asking them about their theology. He's asking them about their experience. He's not asking them what they understand. He's asking them what they have tasted. He says, when you believed, did you receive the Spirit? Now, if you see this simple question and you think about it logically, you, you'll, you'll see that it really is an amazing question because of its implications. It must be possible, maybe you don't like this idea, but we need to examine what the Bible says and not what we would like it to say. Apparently, it must be possible to believe and yet not receive the Spirit. Because otherwise, Paul couldn't ask this question. When you believed, 
did you receive? If to believe and to receive are the same thing, that question makes no sense at all. But if it's possible to believe and yet not yet to have received, this question makes a lot of sense. So Paul asked the question, when you believed, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And I, I'm not, this isn't the time to do this now, but I, I, I want to ask you this question. I want to ask myself this question. When I believed, did I receive the Holy Spirit? Now, don't quote a verse at me. For this isn't about verses. This isn't about your theology. I'm not checking your theology. I'm asking you, have you tasted? Do you know that you've received the Holy Spirit? And I'm not, by the way, I'm not talking about tongues or tingles either. Now, I'm very happy with both tongues and tingles, but that isn't what I'm talking about. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm talking about a conscious receiving of the Spirit of God so that you know that he's come. When a person is baptized in water, no matter how pious and devout they are, if they were really honest and you asked them afterwards what was it like, they would say it was an overwhelming experience in which I was acutely conscious of water. Water. In my, my nose, in my ears, in my mouth, water, 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 everywhere. That's what happens when someone gets baptized into water. They become supremely conscious of water. When someone is baptized in the Spirit, they become supremely conscious of God. It's an overwhelming experience of God. Not, not necessarily tingles and tongues, but God, the presence of God. They know that He has come. And if you think of some of the, we still sing the kind of hymns from the Redemption Hymnal here, and there's, some, there's quite a lot of them which are very conscious of, of this, this consciousness that he has come. He's come, he's come, he's come. Not I believe he's come, not the verse says he's come. He's come. This is their testimony. Okay, so um, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He's not questioning their theology, but he's testing their experience. The epistles assume that the Spirit is in you. And uh, there's another place where we'll see this kind of worked out. This is an earlier question from Paul when he wrote to the Galatians. Uh, he writes to the Galatians and he, he's trying to prove to them that their salvation, it's all about justification by faith, but he's trying to prove to them their salvation isn't dependent upon their own works, upon their own achievements. And he uses three people to illustrate his point. Um, the first person he illustrates is himself. Because he was, as far as the Jewish pattern was concerned, a righteous man. He was, in, um, he was ahead of all his fellows. He was ahead of them all, his contemporaries, in his Jewish obedience to the faith. Uh, but it wasn't sufficient. And he quotes Abraham as another example of someone who wasn't qualified by his own righteousness, but was qualified because he put his trust in God. And then, and this is a masterstroke, he uses the illustration of the Galatians themselves. And he asks this question. He says, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, he's using, he's, the question he wants to know is whether um, salvation is by faith or by works. But look at the illustration he uses. He uses the illustration of receiving the Spirit. You can't use this illustration unless the people who hear it know what you're talking about. And they won't know what you're talking about if they haven't received the Spirit. So when he says, when you receive the Holy Spirit, he is assuming, well, he was there, wasn't he? I mean, he'd visited all those churches in the area that we now call Galatia. He knew them. He'd see, we've got records of some of these things in the Scriptures, some of the events that were taking place. So again, you can see that this is the assumption of Paul. It's the assumption in his preaching. That when people come into the fullness of Christ, they will have a conscious event 
in which the Spirit of God has come. Now, I want to say this again. I, I'm, not, I'm not sort of trying to go along the lines of any kind of initial evidence. I'm not thinking of tongues. I'm not thinking of tingles. I'm not thinking of... I'm not thinking of you being more pure today than you were yesterday. I'm not thinking of you overcoming temper today when you couldn't overcome. I'm not thinking of any of those things. I'm talking simply about God consciousness. God consciousness. Actually, I believe that revival is really just a return to authentic Christianity in which people are immersed in God. And people who have believed and who have been faithful for many years come into an encounter with God in which they taste of the things that they've believed for decades. Um, but this was, this was normal Christianity. This is the normal Christian life and um, the normal Christian birth. And we need to distinguish between the experience and the truth in the time. The New Testament was written under the assumption that the writer and the readers had personally experienced the coming of the Holy Spirit. That really is important because you will sometimes get people who comfort themselves by saying, well, this verse says this and this verse says this, but who does the verse say it to? Well, almost certainly the verse says it to people who have received the Spirit. Because all the letters, even the Corinthians, and they were in a mess. But there's no doubt about the fact that they had received the Spirit. Okay. <clears throat> so, now what has happened to these people? Do you not know, this is Paul writing in Romans later, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? I'm going to say something now, and you may have heard it said before, but if you haven't, it may surprise you. All baptism is baptism into death. Baptism is a picture of death. And I think one of the one of the lacks of some aspects of Pentecostal and charismatic theology have been that they have concentrated so much on the empowering of the Spirit that they have not noticed that the essence of baptism is always death. It's always a bringing to an end the thing which is the enemy of God. Let me give you a, a lightning kind of illustration. There are at least three, but I'll, I'll just concentrate on two. There are th at least three places in the Old Testament where there are events which the Bible subsequently refers to as baptisms. The first one is Noah's flood. When Peter writes his letter, he refers to Noah's flood and he says it's a figure of baptism. Now, I don't know what you think about in baptism, but uh, Noah's flood, but no Noah's flood was an experience in which they were supremely conscious of water and in which that which was the enemy of God was brought down into death. And it's an amazing thing that for every drop of water that dropped in the flood, it had a double effect. One of the effects was it buried the Egyptians just that little bit deeper. And the second effect was that it actually lifted Noah just that little bit higher. It separated Noah from the people who would have destroyed him. Their unrighteousness had corrupted the whole world with the exception of Noah's family. And that's what the Bible says in, in Genesis chapter 6, that, that, that Noah was pure in all his generations. Um, so that's what it did. It separated and it brought death in order that there could be a new beginning. And I have often speculated and wondered whether, I don't suppose he did, but I've wondered whether when Noah took the, uh, the coverings off the ark and think he, he looked out and said something like, it's a new creation. Old things have passed away. 
Everything's become new. Now we move forward to the story of uh, the Exodus, which Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And he says that the people of Israel were baptized into Moses. He's talking about the crossing of the Red Sea. So he refers to the crossing of the Red Sea as a baptism. And what did it do? It brought death in order that there could be separation so that that which is of God could go on and live. Baptism always does this. This is really what baptism in water symbolically is a symbol of. It's a symbol of the end of the old and the beginning of the new. Uh, there's a, an old legend, and it, I think it may well be true, that in ancient times they used to kind of begin to ha have their baptism by confessing their sins, turning um, away, yeah, turning, I've forgotten which way they turned now. I think they turned west to kind of confess their sins, and then they would turn east to confess their faith in God. It was an old thing. And I, I didn't say it, and maybe I'll go back and say it now, but um, I wonder whether there was at least just one of the mothers of Israel who went down to the seashore and saw all the bodies of the Egyptian soldiers floating face downwards and said to her little children who had been frightened to death, it's a new beginning. Old things have passed away. Everything has become new. That's what a baptism is. And I think that's missing in some of the teaching of Pentecostal charismatic things. They've forgotten the dying bit. Um, and it is, it is crucial because it's, that, that's what makes sense of the whole event in the course of uh, what God is doing in our own personal salvation history. Where have we got to? Okay. They had been baptized. This has got nothing at all to do with water baptism. I'll say more about this um, when we get to Romans chapter 6. But my conviction is that when it speaks of being baptized into Christ, it, has, it isn't referring to water baptism at all. The early Christians were baptized almost certainly using what we call a Trinitarian formula. They were baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But several times in the Acts of the Apostles, you'll find a little reference and it says, and they were, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And they were baptized in the name of Jesus. It doesn't mean they didn't use the Trinitarian formula. It's just a simple way of distinguishing that baptism from John's baptism. They were baptized Jesus wards. This isn't a response to John's uh, preaching and, and, and baptism. So often you get the little phrase about being baptized in the name of Jesus. But there are two, just two instances in the New Testament where it doesn't talk about being baptized into the name of, but it talks about being baptized into the person of. They're baptized not into the name of Jesus, that would be water baptism. They're baptized into Christ himself. They are marinated into the life of Jesus Christ. The other one is in Galatians, where Paul uses exactly the same kind of language um, and talks about being baptized into Christ. It's, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a key thing that we, this is God's way of taking us out of what we were in and putting us into Jesus Christ. And uh, that's what it's all, that's what it's about. Um, they've been baptized in Christ's death. Their experience, their encounter of the Holy Spirit, had united them in the Spirit with Christ's death. The subjective truth was that they had received the Spirit, and they knew it. The objective truth was that they had been baptized into Christ, Christ's Calvary baptism. Do you remember that Jesus referred to his death as a baptism? Remember that? I have a baptism to be baptized. Baptism is always baptism into death. It's always the predominant figure in baptism is death. And when the death is over, when the old has passed away, then you can begin the new. What you can never do is live with one foot in each camp. It's either or. This is not something that we may feel or taste, but it's just as true. That's to say, being united with Christ into his death. Um, you don't have to have 
a kind of an experience where you yourself feel that you have been crucified with Christ or feel that your sins have come to an end. All you need is the revelation truth made real by the Holy Spirit of God. That's what you need. But you do need a consciousness of the coming of the Spirit. And we shall need to base our lives on that. Okay? Now we're going to come on to the story of two men. And this is really quite an amazing piece of the Bible. There's nothing else quite like this in the Bible. This is a unique piece of pure revelation. This isn't um, Paul putting one verse to another verse. This is God by his Spirit bringing amazing truth, which explains things that have no other ever explanation. This is what I'm talking about here. Oh, I just thought you might be interested in that. Can you see that? I thought I'd just do that simply to kind of make a point to you. And that is, the, the, the Greek language and the Greek letters as they were written um, were written without spaces in between the words and with no punctuation. Can you read that? For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law, and so on. I won't kind of struggle through it. Um, but it, the reason I, wa I want to say that is because I've got a big piece of scripture here for you. This is Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to verse 21. And this is reading from the New King James Version, but most versions do something similar with this. Um, and I want you to notice that here there's a bracket, the beginning of a parenthesis. Okay? And here's the other one. So most of this passage of the Scripture, according to the translators of the New King James Version, is actually a parenthesis. Now, the ancient Greeks didn't use punctuation. They didn't use parentheses. But they had an ability, and it's in Paul's writings, and actually, this isn't really kind of quite so relevant, but in ancient, in older times, people like Tyndale, when they did their studies at university, they were taught to think like this. They were taught to think in what kind of computer scientists would call kind of nested blocks of things. You can have one idea inside another idea, and another idea inside that idea. So you can... And it, it, it's really important to kind of work out what's inside these things. I think there's a, a, there's a real case for suggesting maybe that the whole of chapter 6, sorry, the whole of chapter 7 and chapter 8 are, is actually, 6 and 7, sorry, is a parenthesis. You can, you can try this when you get home. Read from the end of chapter 5 straight into Romans chapter 8. And you'll see it, it, it flows on almost seamlessly. So what's happening here? Well, this is a kind of a, a big illustration in the middle of something. <coughs> but we'll, we'll need to understand what's in this. Um, let me show you another thing that might help us to break down some big sections of Scripture like this. <coughs> here's, a, here's a word. The word one. Can you see it scattered through that? Through that that's, um, I think that's one, two, three, four, five, seven, is it? Seven. Okay. Every time it says one man there, it's actually referring to a definite person. It's referring to Adam. And it's telling us that there was, a, there was one man, and we know him as Adam, and he... There was an event in his life which had a lasting impact on the human race. Um, we'll say a little bit more about that as we get to it now. But then there's another one man. And this one I've kind of put red circles around. Um, there's the first one. And this one man is Jesus Christ. And then it comes again through the one, Jesus Christ. And there again through one man's righteous act. 
and uh, that's so there it is right there that four lines up right on the right so also by one um, man's obedience many will be made righteous so you've got in this passage of scripture you've got two men this this passage of scripture is the story of two men and the impact of what those two men did upon the lives of people who are still connected to them people who are still of Adam's family, who are still in Adam, what Adam did continues to impact their lives. Those who have been baptized into Christ, that are in Christ, there are things that he did on the cross, and what he did on the cross will continue to impact their lives. Let's um, break it up a little bit. This is what I call congenital sin. It's usually called original sin, or sometimes it's called hereditary sin. Um, and what Paul is doing is actually, he's asking a logical question. If you, if you follow his reasoning through Romans chapter 5, and uh, you'll see that he, he talks about the fact that um, when there's no law, you can't quantify sin, you can't measure sin when there's no law. So without law, there's no transgression, he says. Now, if you're quick on the uptake, and Paul's nearly always kind of quicker than us anyway, he gets there before we do, but there's a question going through his mind. If that's true, that sin is measurable only when the law is in place, and that the verdict against the sinner is death, and we see that around us and we say, well, everyone dies. There's a question. And the question is, what about the people in between Adam and Moses when there was no law? Why did they die? If it's true that without the law, there is no transgression, then the people between Adam and Moses have no score against them. So why did they die? The problem is much deeper than we knew. And Paul is now going to explain to us in pure revelation exactly what took place. Adam, the first man, and his legacy. I'm quoting verses here from Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. We'll come back to these at another point. Through one man, sin entered into the world. This is a really important verse. Look at it and understand that what this verse is telling us very clearly, if we've got the eyes to see it, is that sin is older than the human race. Sin entered through one man. It didn't come into existence as a result of one man's sin. Sin entered. Each of us tonight entered through that door into this building. But we didn't only then come into existence. Some of us have been in existence a long time before we came here tonight. Um, but there was a point at which we came into this room. Sin is older than the human race. The original sin was actually an angelic rebellion. And human sin is one of the knock-on effects of that angelic rebellion. That's why it was a fallen angel who came and uh, brought in the seeds. And what he did was he sowed into the human race an alien spirit, a spirit of disobedience, so that Adam became something different to what God had made him. Something happened in his nature. And the Bible expresses this in different ways. It talks about the spirit of disobedience. Um, there's something in human beings which is at war with God. And when God begins to lay down the law, it rises up against him in protest. That's what Paul will tell us later on in Romans chapter 7. Um, it, it will always do that. Um, through one man, sin entered into the world. So this is why I prefer to talk about congenital sin rather than original sin, because the original sin was Satan's. 
But this is this is kind of this is the next stage of things. By one man's offence, many died. We're still talking about Adam. As a result of Adam's sin, many died. God said this to Adam. He said, in the day that you eat of the fruit of that tree, dying you will die. That's the Hebrew uh, 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 idiom for it. It really means the ultimate death. You'll experience the ultimate death. He's not talking about physical death. Physical death is a consequence. The Adam lived for, what, 960-odd years before the undertakers got hold of him. But actually, he died the day he took the fruit. Something in Adam died. Something... He was no longer in the image and likeness of God. There was something in him. The rebel was on the inside. That which came through the one, that which came through the one who had sinned. So Adam sinned by one man's disobedience. Many were made sinners. Of God to tell us in the, in the book of As through one man's offense, judgment came to all men. So God, God said that if Adam sinned, dying he would die and he sinned and his death impacted the whole human race the whole human race uh, our time's gone but I, I, and I don't want to gabble through this but um, think about this technically the first sin in the human race was committed by a woman but she's never blamed for committing the first sin. It's always the men. Eve's sin had no impact upon Adam. But Adam's sin impacted Eve and the whole of the human race. That is a spiritual entity called the human race. And its federal head was Adam. And when he rebelled, he took the whole body into rebellion with him. Stretching down through the centuries, every single part. You and I were born rebels. We were born in rebel territory. We were born under a rebel leader. Um, and we've done the works of the rebel leader. Um, it resulted in condemnation. The condemnation is the carrying out of the sentence. Remember, we talked about this a little bit at one stage. Condemnation isn't a bad feeling in the Bible. Condemnation is the carrying out of the sentence. So what was the carrying out of the sentence? Well, Adam died. He was separated from God and the source of life. Read the story of the book of Genesis. You'll see the angels were posted on the eastern gate with flaming swords to guard the way so that Adam could not get back to the tree of life. If he does say said God, he'll live forever as what he has become. Virtually an incarnate demon. That's what would have happened if he'd got back to the tree of life. Um, resulting in condemnation. Now, the condemnation is this spiritual death. Oh, I wish I'd got more time now. But um, I'll say it and maybe I'll explain it in the new year when you've forgotten it all again. Um, some people think that the condemnation is that the whole human race go to hell as a result of Adam's sin. That is not what this says. The condemnation was death. The sentence was death. And it was carried out in the day that Adam sinned. So in fact, each one of us is born dead. The sentence has already taken place. If I understand it rightly, People who finally end in hell end there because of their own sin, not because of Adam's. Because of their own rebellion. Because they themselves have not repented. And <clears throat> let's go on quickly. By one man's offense, death reigned. Have you noticed what's happened here? Before this time, Paul was talking about sin, and he was talking about sin as transgressions that you could kind of add up on a scorecard. Sins were things that you did and that you incurred transgression because you'd broken some law. But now he's not using that kind of language. Now he's talking power language. Now he's talking about sin reigning. 
Sin is in charge. Sin isn't just something that Adam is doing. Sin is something that's got Adam by the, by the scruff of the neck. Sin has become the dominant thing. And Paul is moving now from sin as a transgression, as an act of disobedience. He's moving from that <coughs> to the idea of sin as a spiritual dynamic, as something which directs and controls the way a man lives his life. By one man's disobedience, many were made, and that's the Greek word constituted, many were constituted sinners. We are sinners because we were born sinners. Because we had the nature that came into our race as a result of Adam's sin. Quickly, I'm nearly finished. He's the second man and his legacy. This is, this is just going through that same passage of Scripture. As a result of Christ's, what he has achieved, we receive the gift of grace. And then he goes on, an abundance of grace. I like that. Not just grace, but an abundance of grace. Grace will guarantee justification by faith. An abundance of grace will bring you into the much more of the gospel. The gift of righteousness. Not just righteousness added to your account, but righteousness imparted, given to you, so that your nature is transformed. Instead of sin reigning as a result of this man's one act upon the cross, we have the capacity, we have the authority as we are rightly related to him to reign in life. And it's life that's justified. That's an interesting phrase. It's not just, not just the criminal who is justified, but his life is squared up, made right. Made righteous, that's what the Bible says. Not just reckoned righteous, it's made righteous. All men are either in Adam or in Christ. Those are mutually exclusive conditions. We are either in Adam or we are in Christ. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. Look how um, all-embracing these statements are. We know that we've passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Okay, we'll pray. Thank you. That was an extra five minutes. No extra charge. Uh, but we finish now until the new year. It's, I think, the 8th, the 8th of January. <clears throat> Lord, so much information here, Lord, but I do pray that you will help us to sift through it with an open heart. And to hear what you want to say to us. To be challenged if we need to be challenged. To be encouraged where we need to be encouraged. To be instructed and given light, Lord, where we're in perplexities. Lord, will you open up your heart to us and show us where we stand and how we stand. And if we lack anything, Lord, by your Spirit, come consciously and complete the work, Lord. Make us all aflame for Jesus Christ. Saturate us, marinate us in all, in all the lovely fragrance of his life, Lord, and let that life be tasteable in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our world. Amen. Amen.